Okay, folks. Uh, thanks for logging in here. Um, my name is Steve Carlson. I'm a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and uh, I'll be I'll be your host for this farminar tonight. Um, so first of all, I'm going to do a little introduction here, and then um, talk a little about about PFI, and then and then I'll turn it over to our to our presenters. But tonight we've got two different horticulture farmers who will. Who grow for completely different markets and they're going to describe their seed starting process and first up we've got Susan Utes who grows with local harvest CSA near Solon Iowa and then following Susan uh, tonight is Glenn Ellsburn from G it's, Fr it's fresh up in Cresco in Northeast Iowa and Glenn grows plant starts and produce for for market so we're going to see a lot of differences between the seed starting practices at these two farms and we'll hopefully spark some ideas for all of you to incorporate into your operations. But like I said before I turn it over to these two I'm going to run through a quick intro about PFI. So this is a farminar. We do these farminars every Tuesday night pretty much between about mid-November to, to mid-March so you can see there's a few left this season and um, next week is one that you might find interesting that is a uh, walk-in cooler considerations and construction. We've got uh, Tim Landgraf and Tony Thompson joining us to to do next week, so that'll be a good a good week to tune in as well. If you happen to miss uh, a farminar that we do and you're interested in it, um, we do these uh, we archive these, and so each one of these is recorded. You can find them at that link right there on the website in our archives. There's just over 110 or so in our archives, so a lot of topics in there for you to dig through. Uh, so if you're not familiar, Practical Farmers of Iowa started back in 1985. PFI is a, a nonprofit organization. We're made up of farmers and friends of farmers. And our farmers come from farms of all sizes and enterprises, you know, livestock, horticulture, row crops, and everything in between, and from all across the state of Iowa and far beyond the state of Iowa. So there's a lot of people tuning in from out of state, and um, you're welcome to, you know, take advantage of PFI and our membership. At PFI, our mission is to strengthen farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And uh, we use this focus to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the people. Our values at PFI, welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. So as I mentioned, we are a farmer-led organization, uh, a member-based organization, and we'd love to have you join us. Uh, if you if you become a member of PFI, that allows you really to tap into our network of members, which is the most valuable resource we have is, is everyone else that's a member. Um, you, you'll also get our newsletters that we send out quarterly. You get discounts to our events. We hold dozens of events every year, and you have the opportunity to participate in research projects and all of our other programming. We have a lot of beginning farmer programs, and our members also help guide our programming, so you really get an input on um, what we do as an organization. Um, I'd encourage you to go check out our website for our upcoming events. We have an event calendar that's full of stuff, not just PFI events, but non-PFI events as well. Uh, but the thing I'm real excited about is this weekend on Friday and Saturday in Boone, Iowa, we have uh, our annual Next Generation Beginning Farmer Retreat. And this Beginning Farmer Retreat is only $20 for PFI members, $40 for non-members, and this right now is your last chance to sign up because I'm going to take registration down by tomorrow. And, and so this event, like I said, is in Boone, Iowa. It starts 1 p.m. Friday, goes to 1 p.m. Saturday, and in, in that time we're going to cover a bunch of farm financial stuff and effective marketing, and um, we're going to have plenty of time for networking with other beginning farmers. It's a really fun event that we've been doing for about eight years now. And it's a good way to sit down and make some progress on your farm business. <clears throat> so the link to register is right there in the middle of the screen. You can see that there. So uh, lastly, then, I wanted to say that everybody looks like they're doing a great job of entering their, con their, their um, location and their email address in the chat box there. Like I said, we uh, collect that for uh, grant reporting purposes and, um, and also to help evaluate our farm and ours. Um, but that chat box that you're typing in right now, that's where we uh, ask you to type your questions. So if you have questions for our presenters tonight, 
feel free to enter them into the chat box. If they if they see them while they're speaking and they want to answer it, that's fine. But otherwise, I'll make sure we go back through all of our questions that are in the chat box at the end of the night. We're going to reserve the final 30 minutes from about 8 to 8.30 Central Time to go back through all of those questions. So um, type them in there if you want as they come up, but um, don't be offended if we don't get to it immediately. We'll come back around and, and answer those questions. So uh, thanks again. For tuning in, and now I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up Susan Ute's presentation, and she's gonna start uh, talking about her seed starting methods. Thanks, Steve. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our farminar. It's an amazing list of people from all over the country. Some of my neighbors are on, and I see people as far away as Canada, so great to see that. I'm going to give you just a little background on my farm. I bought my farm on contract on April Fool's Day in 1994. My neighbors tended to think the date rather appropriate, especially when they learned that I intended to farm on 80 acres. At the time I bought the farm, my four children ranged in age from two to eight. Our family goal from the outset was to treat our farm as a business and develop a profitable farming operation. We had experience raising pigs, sheep, and goats, and for the next 12 years, we used conventional and direct markets to sell animal products and animals. After all my children left home, I decided to keep the sheep. I like them and find they are less time consuming than the other animals we used to have on our farm. Their primary purpose is to graze the pastures and provide fertilizer for our vegetable fields. They provide some added income, but the CSA is the principal money-making enterprise on my farm. I started using soil blocks as a home gardener and really liked the system, so continued to use soil blocks when I started my CSA. Tonight I will talk about the design and factors I considered in building my germination house as well as the process we use to grow seedlings for our CSA market. My system is distinctly different from Glenn's, not only because we use soil blocks, but because we are growing for very different markets. Because our CSA start date is not until mid-April, heat is not as important in our system as it is in Glenn's. My CSA, Local Harvest CSA, is entering its 20th year. I started with 18 shares, and at our peak in 2010, we had 300 shares. After that rather crazy year, we settled into a more manageable size in the 175 to 250 share range. We have two tunnels that contribute to our three season CSA. This is a list of the things that I considered when I decided I needed to move beyond the basement, barn, neighbor's greenhouse system that I was using to grow my seedlings. We built our germination house in the fall of 2010 with primarily used materials. Our approximate cost um, minus the fans was $800, and as you can see, we um, built it on a concrete floor that was part of an old building site. In 08, we had a big barn go down, and when we got that cleaned off, we decided to um, put up the germ house in that area. This is another germ house. Kate Edwards is a young farmer who lives near here, is in the process of building a germination house. Using a kit from Polytex, her cost with all new materials was just over $4,000. I think it's great that she's building a germ house at this stage. I wish I had built one years ago. It would have paid off in um, time, energy, and peace of mind. So we run um, power to our germ house using an extension cord from a nearby outdoor pole with outlets. Uh, I would say all the extension cords inside the tunnel are not great, but it works. Again, this is not ideal. Doors and windows aren't necessarily ideal ventilation, but the hoops, which we acquired for less than $100, dictated the height of the structure, and I didn't want to deal with extending the height or roll-up sides, so I opted for using doors 
wind a window and a solar peak vent for ventilation. It does require a certain amount of tension, but it does work okay most of the time. Four fans are positioned in a circular pattern, keeping the air moving in the germ house. That's really important. Um, although the initial cost of the fans seemed high, that first set that I put in in my a previous tunnel lasted for 14 years. Yes, CSA does stand for Community Supported Agriculture. Uh, the air, it's a double inflated polytunnel. The air between the layers of poly provides insulation, reducing our heating costs and condensation. In addition, the um, inflated roof keeps the noise level down on windy days, which uh, really improves the atmosphere in the tunnel when we're working in there. Uh, another bonus of the double inflated poly is that a heavy snow load is easier to manage. Some of it slides off on its own, and the remaining part we just sweep off. To control the temperature in our germ house when we have to, we use this heater that screws onto a propane tank. However, we only use it when the temperatures are dropping low enough to, damage, to cause damage to our warm weather crops, our peppers and eggplants. When we are expecting cool nights, we shut the germ house so that it heats up around 85. And unless the nighttime temperature drops below 25, the temps in the greenhouse doesn't go below 40 when the house is filled with soil blocks. Uh, this is a couple of pictures from a really cold night when we did use the heater and tarps to get a little more heat in there for the peppers and eggplants. This uh, ugly germination unit has seen many lies, and it cost me very little money, however. It is located in a well-insulated, semi-underground room in an old barn, so it costs very little to run. I use it for germinating tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. We move those warm season germinated seedlings in their trays then to the heat mats in the germination house until we can transplant them into the soil blocks. If needed, this little unit that you can see in the photo is set up so we can create a mini tunnel using the hoops and the poly. In the summer, we use a shade cloth on our germination house so that we can use it for growing summer seedlings and drying onions. We um, grow lettuce in our high tunnel from March through December. So we're starting lettuce seedlings from late February through late September. As you can see, our watering system in my germ house is one of our more sophisticated systems. I've looked into automated systems but have decided against them for multiple reasons. Volunteers and workers love working in our germination house. Seeding is a favorite among the many jobs on the farm, especially when it's cold outside. In about a month, when we have lots of seedlings going in there, that's where everybody, everyone wants to be. I am going to shift gears here and talk about starting seedlings with soil blocks. In 1997, one of my volunteers gave me my first floor blocker. I was using a handheld soil blocker, and once I used the floor blocker, there was no going back. That original blocker finally fell apart two years ago. I gave it to my brother, who's uh, very handy with things, and I think he's resurrected it, but I don't know that I'll ever get it back. We use two sizes of blockers, the 20 and the 12. The Stand Up 20 is a blocker that we use the most. We use it for all of our seedlings except tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Um, our trays hold a 120 of this size block. And we do not transplant out of these blocks into a larger block or container. The uh, Stand Up 12 is the one we use for peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes. Once they're germinated in the germ cha chamber, we um, transfer them directly to the 12-size block. 
using a popsicle stick to make a hole we drop the seedlings into the blocks right up to the leaves at five to six weeks the tomatoes are ready to go in the field and at seven to eight weeks the peppers and eggplants are ready for field planting our trays hold 72 of this block size and again we do not transplant into a larger block Uh, in an effort to streamline our system, my son Ruben designed and built these wooden trays. They're easy to build and they last for years if they are cleaned and stored in the germination house to dry immediately following use. This is the materials list that we use for the wood trays. We use six wood screws on the bottom and two to fasten the side ends. We have um, more than 150 of these trays, and every two to three years we make some new ones to replace the old ones as they wear out. There are recipes out there for soil blocks, mi block mixes, and I made my own early on, but as our needs increased, I talked with Dave Sickles, the owner of Beautiful Land Products in West Branch, Iowa, which is very close to us. And with some experimentation, he designed a mix that became the C3 we use today. We order by the pallet, and they deliver to our farm, so the cost per bag includes delivery. Terrence Holub, using C3 as his base, has designed a custom mix that he likes. I'm sharing this, his formula with you with his permission. TD operates a CSA near Coggin, Iowa. He feels that the worms that get into his mix contribute fertilizer to the blocks, and if he needs to hold seedlings until the weather is suitable, the seedlings do well. Thanks, TD, for sharing. After about 15 years ago, I transferred my planting plan to an Excel spreadsheet, and each year I modify that plan to represent current needs and varieties. Once that's done, I create a weekly seeding chart. This goes out to the germ house on a clipboard along with the seeds needed for the weekly seeding. My workers and volunteers are trained to read the chart so they can proceed with making soil blocks and seeding without me present in the germ house. We uh, typically do our weekly seeding in one day. Now if I can figure out how to use this arrow, which If you, at the top of the chart here, you can see the total number of trays, 29 trays that need to be seeded. That tells the person who is um, making the soil blocks that they need to plan to do that many soil blocks. Um, and then down here, it lists the varieties right on this line, and it tells them which blocker to use. The 120 is a smaller one. It tells them that they're going to be doing two trays, and in this column it tells them that they'll be doing one seed per block. So down here, for example, they're doing three trays and two seeds per block. So that it helps them in multiple ways to have this information. Let's see, I saw a question over here on why wood trays over the plastic trays. Um, one of the reasons that we started using wood trays is because the, the soil blocks, they don't fit into the plastic. The plastic trays that we could get at the time did not, we couldn't fill a whole tray. So there was, with the using the blocker efficiently, we would have to, you know, separate out a line of blocks and fill the tray that way. And if we didn't fill the tray, then we had um, trouble with them drying out around the edges. So that's one of the reason, reasons that we use, use the wooden trays because it, there was really nothing available. I think there may be soil block trays available now that would fit in our system, but they weren't available at the time. And we do not sanitize them at all. Hang on, I've got a problem here with my computer. Wow. 
Okay, hang on. I'm having my computer's about to die here. I'm, I apologize. I thought I had that all set up ready so that it wouldn't happen. Um, no, we don't use, I see there's another question about the trays. We do not use treated lumber. Okay, next. Uh, getting the soil block mix to the right consistency is one of the more difficult aspects of soil blocking. It takes some practice for inexperienced people to get the moisture level right. When training new people on this job, we use the squeeze test to determine the appropriate moisture level. A small amount of water should ooze out as you squeeze. And you can see the same thing happening um, when you actually use your blocker if there's a little water squeezing out through the the cells of the blocker you can tell that it's uh, that it's the right moisture level there is a technique to using the blocker but with a little practice most people get the hang of it pretty quickly and it takes six sets of this blocker to fill um, one of our trays. Using the 20 blocker, we get 240 blocks on two trays. And that's the, the picture shows exactly how we set it up to block them. That way, one of the things is the, the soil mix is really expensive, so we try not to have any waste when we're working with it. We use pelleted seed whenever we can get it. For lettuce and most of our brassicas, we use one seed per block. Johnny says that an experienced grower can make and seed 2,500 blocks per hour. That would be 20 of our trays in an hour. Some of our most experienced workers do come pretty close to that speed. The we label all of our trays two ways with popsicle sticks and the masking tape. The info on the stick is useful in evaluating varieties in the germ house, and it's also useful when workers are planting in the field. One of the things I like about it is that they learn to recognize types of seedlings and variety names, which also streamlines the harvest process. We can put a variety name up on the board, and they can go ahead and find that variety out in the field. Uh, for the field plants, we transfer the small stick information to big orange labeling sticks that we use in the field. When transplanting in the high tunnel, the small sticks serve a dual purpose of labeling the seedlings in the tunnel. We do multiple seeds per block for kohlrabi, bok choy, and certain spring green varieties. Our five-variety Asian greens mix is our most time-consuming seeding but it pays off at harvest time when we can cut and bag a greens bunch in seconds. We can just grab a bunch, cut it, and put it in a bag, and we're done. And we have a beautiful mix. You can see the mix in the picture on the right. Yeah, I see there's a question about the soil block size that we're using. We're using two different sizes. And the one that we're showing for the 200, for the 120 per tray is it's 20 cells in a block. Denise had the answer there for us. Um, we could probably, we could definitely, I, I, it's likely that we could improve our seeding system, seeding time with a vacuum seeder, but our workers and our volunteers love being in the germ house in the spring. So for now we seed by hand. I think um, Glenn will talk about using a vacuum seeder. See, even, even my four-year-old grandson can seed pelleted lettuce and do a pretty good job as a matter of fact. 
As I indicated earlier, we hand water our seedlings in the germination house. I like the hand watering because it gives me the opportunity to custom apply water according to the individual needs of the, of the wide variety of plants that we have in our germ house at any given time. And the other thing I like about it is I use this time to observe germination rates and growth habits of varieties and then I record those on our planting spreadsheet for future decision making. We hand plant all of our transplants into the high tunnel in the field. Uh, one of the primary reasons I've stayed with hand planting despite the number of transplants we field plant is due to the labor force that has been available to me over the years. During the spring season when we were doing most of our transplanting in the field, I used students, first my children and then their friends, and it's just the word is kind of spread, so we have a lot of college students that come in and want to work in the spring. Uh, most often I have one person planting after they get out of classes, so a machine requires several people, so I found that the variable schedules of my seasonal workers facilitated hand planting in a timely fashion. My experienced child or work out, worker could get out in the field and plant hundreds of seedlings on their own with no time spent setting up a machine and waiting on enough people to work the machine. Um, I see a question there about do we cover the seeds? No, we do not. We found that is not necessary. The other day when it was cold, I wanted my grandson to go out to the high tunnel with me and take some pictures, and he refused. So we staged these two pictures um, in the house for your benefit. We used the two-inch cement trowel as, as it's shown in the, in the top photo. Um, we stick it in the dirt or through the plastic, pull back and drop in the block, and move on to the next one. A nice thing is the handle also serves as a convenient measuring device in the field for a more accurate spacing of the plants. Okay, this is another TD Holub uh, uses, as I mentioned earlier, uses soil blocks. And he uses this planter to plant soil blocks on bare ground and in plastic. And he says that it works really well. And by increasing the water flow on the planter, he's been able to wait a week for rain without the transplants wilting or dying, even on hot, sunny days. Um, just sort of a cautionary note about this machine. If you plan to continue planting by hand, don't let your workers talk to TD, sorry, TD, or see one of these in action. We made that mistake this past summer, and uh, we've been hearing a little bit about it. We were involved in an energy study with PFI, and during the time period we collected the data for this study, we had three farms growing seedlings for their CSAs in our germination house. So we were really moving seedlings through the germination house at a very rapid rate. At the time, I wasn't using a germination chamber to germinate the tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. I was using the heat mats. And after I saw the amount of electricity the mats were using, I changed my setup to include um, the germination chambers so that I could reduce the use, use of the mats and also my electricity costs. And you can see more details on that study um, at, that, at the link that I've provided on this slide. Because we seldom use heat in our germ house, our seedlings are subjected to dramatic temperature shifts. Perhaps due to this, hardening off of our seedlings is not a necessity. After a th thorough soaking of the seedlings by immersion in a shallow water tank, uh, we frequently transplant the seedlings directly from the germ house into the high tunnel and the field. This is especially true in the spring and early summer. Most of the time, our soil mo moisture in the early season is sufficient, so we do not irrigate field transplants except when we are transplanting into plastic. And um, once we check and find that the soil moisture is not sufficient, we will run the drip irrigation. We do irrigate the transplants in the high tunnel, however, usually within 48 hours of planting, except during the summer when we run the irrigation immediately to cool down the soil. 
The air pruning of the roots that occurs naturally with soil blocks lends itself to rapid growth in the field, and we have a very high survival rate following transplanting. In fact, we often have 100% survival of our transplants. And that is the end of my presentation. So are we ready to go on to Glenn? Yeah, yeah, great work, Susan. Thank you very much. Um, and just just before I uh, give it up to Glenn here, I did want to clarify a little bit. For those who aren't familiar, um, uh, Susan rep, uh, referenced a, a research report there, and that's part of uh, at Practical Farmers of Iowa. We work with our uh, farming members to develop these replicated on-farm research trials to um, in, to basically delve deep into some issues that that they're concerned about. So this that one was on um, the energy use cost of starting seedlings, and so that that's three different member farms that uh, tracked a whole bunch of data that we helped compile. And so if you check out that research report, that should answer some questions about energy use for different methods of starting your seedlings. We have hundreds of these research reports on our website, and another one that Susan just did this um, this year, I'm, I'll put here in the chat box uh, again. So this is another one that had to, she talked a lot about soil blocks today, and um, so that was another, this is a research report, it looks like I accidentally pasted that twice in there, but that's uh, basically data on um, using soil blocks versus plug trays. So that might answer some questions you could have about uh, the benefits of soil blocks versus plug trays. Um, and now Glenn is going to share with us um, his uh, his methods of starting seeds with G. It's fresh. So Glenn, if you're ready to go, go ahead and take it over. Is my mic working now? There we go. Y yep, there we go. Uh, I started G. It's fresh in 2008. Um, we started out for starting our plants. Uh, we had a building at my parents' farm that, uh, we hadn't been using. I had gotten some, um, picture windows from a friend. So we converted the building into a germ room and that's what, where we had started our seedlings. Uh, we quickly learned that, uh, just having the light from the south facing windows, they would all uh, face that way. And we ended up um, purchasing a, a cold frame type greenhouse. Um, it, we um, did that for, one season and then uh, we ended, it was an unheated structure and we ended up uh, having a, it got, we had started uh, put plants in there in um, March and then we ended up getting a, uh, it froze in April. So we ended up losing a bunch of plants. So the, the following year we ended up renting some greenhouse space from a friend of ours, which then we, uh, at the same, same time, we had started looking into the high tunnel program through NRCS and realized that we could um, get a loan from them to put up a greenhouse, uh, which it ended up costing the same to for payment on the greenhouse as it did to rent space. So we built a 30 by 72 greenhouse. Uh, it was a farm tech kit. Um, we, um, at first we, we had been using it for uh, our on-farm transplants. Um, and as time has gone on, we've, uh, uh, we start um, onion transplants for other farms now. Uh, and we also have, uh, we do hanging baskets of flowers 
to sell at farmer's market in spring to help uh, hold the heat in. So it um, has more heat mass to make it through the cold. Now this is some of our uh, onion transplants that we've uh, start. We start around 300,000 uh, transplants each year. Uh, we've uh, we use uh, cow's uh, potting soil. Uh, we get it by the sling. It's about $140 for a sling. We really like uh, their the compost that we get from them. Uh, we use plug flats. So it's real fine so it fits in into the plug flats. Uh, we had used um, some other potting soil that had twigs and we were much happier with uh, what the cows moo. Um, the reason we use plug flats, uh, they're, it's easy to move them in our greenhouse. Uh, we me uh, mechanically um, transplant them out into the field. Um, oh, question on the cow's moo, we, it's actually the orange, uh, the orange variety is what we use. Um, for our onions, we use uh, 288 count flats. Um, we have a vacuum seeder that we have set up that we can plant uh, 50 per hour with that, uh, with my wife and I. Uh, let's see. There's uh, the pl uh, plugs. Uh, that we were transplanting out into the field. At one point, when we, uh, when we first started, we had uh, uh, 10 to 15 acres of, of produce. That's why we had decided to go with as large a greenhouse as we did. This is our vacuum seeder. The what we do. Uh, we pour a seed on here. Uh, it's hooked up to a one gallon shot vac. We I shake it around until there's uh, one or two seeds on each hole. There's uh, 288 holes. Uh, it's at, This is actually a piece of polycarb. Um, and then there's a nozzle that goes from the hose that's lined up with the uh, channel from the polycarb. So after I shake the seed around, that there's a seed on each hole that uh, I tip it to the left side so that it uh, the excess seed goes into this uh, trough. And then I continue flipping it to uh, the left. And then um, the, all the seed goes into here. Um, that, then once it's flipped over and set on, lined up with the flat, I have a ball valve that we turn it off and then it drops all the seeds all at once. Um, we also have used a dial seeder. Uh, this year we added a, a vi it's uh, called a vibro seeder, uh, which is um, I got it out of the Johnny's catalog. Been fairly happy with that, but uh, we pref we prefer the vacuum seeder that it's it's a lot faster. Um, in our greenhouse, um, we use uh, micro sprinklers on a timer. The reason we've opted to to use micro sprinklers is it's more even and uh, we can anyone can water it uh, even it, we've had it set up where it's just on a valve that you turn on and off um, but I've gone to 
timer so that it ends up not being run for, uh, that it doesn't get forgotten. Um, it's, um, it's happened to us a few times, so it's it's just better for better to that we have uh, the timer to turn the valves on and off. Um, even with the timer, though, we still uh, are very watch very closely to make sure they're not getting overwatered or underwatered. That we uh, adjust the time accordingly. Uh, I actually had a video that I was going to put on, but I didn't didn't get it done up uh, for the the cedar. Um, this is. We actually we uh we have two greenhouses. We purchased a second one at auction this past spring, and this is uh, this is picture was taken uh, last week. We planted uh, uh, we start we start our onions the last week of January. Um, we planted this in. Uh, my wife and I planted it. I think what we planted it in four four days, I believe. Um, uh, we also use radiant heat in our greenhouse so that we can keep the ambient temperature lower, and it also increases our our um, germination rate. Uh, we usually, with our onion seed, seedlings, once they're seeded within four or five days, we usually start seeing the, them uh, start to germinate. Oh, Steve is wondering where all the onions are at. The, the, there's uh, 650 flats. There's 350 on this bench and 180 on both out, outside benches. The, the two things on this, the table here are too far apart. Uh, this was when I first started in 2010. They actually should be. Uh, we put one in between each of them because uh, we were ended up having a wavy germination where right over the heat it would uh, was nice, but then it wasn't germed where in between. Uh, when we first started, we used a tank water heater. Uh, I think it was it was a it was a, a 20 gallon tank heater, and it worked, but we were only able to run a couple benches at a time. Uh, when propane spiked uh, to over, oh, I think it was two years ago, we we purchased the corn stove. When propane went uh, over three or four dollars a gallon, so that we had uh, different sources of, of heat rather than just propane. Um, and by when we went to the corn stove, we had the appropriate BTUs to properly uh, heat the water um, on the, on the, the tables. Uh, onion, onions can uh, tolerate cooler temperatures. Um, for moving the heat. Of, for the ambient temperature in our greenhouse, we have a uh, one fan with a uh, it's called a convection tube. We have uh, the holes are at uh, um, I believe they're at four and six o'clock uh, on the tube. Uh, we uh, opted to go with this versus one fan because it was cheaper initial cost for having the one fan to move the air the length of the greenhouse and 
we just have that right in front of our our um, furnace. Um, for cooling, we have uh, we originally I had them the greenhouse set up so that the louvers would open when the uh, fan turned on. I have since uh, have them on a different. I now have them on a different thermostat so that they open up uh, before the fan will kick on, so that I don't have to have the big fan running all the time. And this is the our two new our two greenhouses. We just uh, we're we're finishing. Uh, moving them, the one on the left we had gotten at auction. That was the one with all the onion, picture of all the onion transplants in it. And the one on the right was the one that we had gotten and started with in 2010. Uh, well, I put the picture of our crick in here because that, this is our last slide of what, what we have. Uh, it always, when, one thing, it's, I always like to remember why we're why we enjoy farming from the different from the, the crick is why we enjoy farming on our farm. Um, Great. And, hey, hey, Glenn. I'm sorry. Go on if you got some more here. I just knew this oh, is. that's that's fine. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you if you don't mind. Um, Will you kind of uh, you, you touched on it a little bit? Will you discuss a little bit more about your your markets? Because because uh, I know you've expanded over the time and you talked about growing between the two greenhouses, but a little bit now about where you where you sell all your transplants and and what other markets you sell your stuff at. Our for our onion transplants are uh, is based on mail order. Uh, we put we have an ad that we place in the Moses broadcaster every year, and we've started. I think we the first year in 2011 we sold, I believe 40 or 50 thousand, and every year since then it's grown. Um, that's why we uh, went uh, added uh, second greenhouse. What do you mean? Uh, this this year we're. I, we'll have over 300,000 plants that will be going out our door. Wow. Yeah, is that still primarily uh, onions as far as the transplants that you sell mail order? Yeah, that's, that... that's all onion transplants. We do uh, custom plant starts for other people. Um, and we still have uh, room for this coming season if there's uh, – Anyone that's it's interested in either onions or uh, custom transplants, um, or I should say, uh, certified organic custom transplants, if if they would need that. Oh. Great, yeah. And before we bring Susan into the Q and A, and folks, go ahead and start um, thinking of your questions and getting them in the chat box. Um, but before we bring Susan in, it looks like uh, Jordan's got a question about your spacing on onions in the field, Glenn. Uh, yes, our onions that we uh, grow in the field, we have uh, six by six, as in six inches by six inches on a uh, plastic. We, we grow, we've gone to growing our onions on a, I believe that bed top is uh, 48 inches. Um, We've gone gone to that because it's we have a it's easier to keep them watered with the drip line so that it doesn't evaporate. Um, we st we still grow produce. We've been uh, changing directions towards uh, milking cows, as seen in the background in the picture. We've um, we still have we'll still probably have uh, about four acres of produce yet, mainly. Uh, in the past, it's been mainly wholesale, but uh, we'll have a little bit of wholesale, um, and most mostly it'll be market garden now. Um. Great, yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, 
So we'll just start going down the line here with these questions that are coming in. It looks like Denise has a question for Susan, and uh, is one that I was wondering about too. Susan touched a little bit on the germination chamber, and Susan, could you explain a little bit more about that, why you use it, and what the heat source is, and all that? Okay, um, the reason that we use it is it's it's an enclosed space, and because of because of um, the high the tunnel that we use, the the germination house that we use, is you know a large space that has sunlight as its light source. I didn't. I had some problems. I would say starting seedlings, peppers, and eggplants on the heat mats. They would get too hot sometimes, and then the the air temperature wouldn't be right, and so. When I started using the germination chamber, which is a closed-in space in which I put a, I don't even use a heat lamp necessarily because it's in an ins in an old barn that's very well insulated. The temperature stays pretty steady in there, and when we use a light bulb, over I as you can see in the, and I don't know how to go back to these pictures, Steve. Um, I can help with that. Here we go. Okay, it's the. We can the germination chamber warm season crops picture uh, number eighteen. That is. Did I miss it? You can you can click on it if you see it. Uh, is that it? Okay, so you can see at the bottom of this picture there there's a heat lamp and then underneath that we put a little container with water and this particular unit was used for research at the University of Iowa so it actually has um, plug-ins and it they work so I can plug the unit in and um, so I have the door shut and it warms up the whole the whole unit is warm and I think that is what helps them to the seedlings to the seeds to germinate faster in there, and then the the water helps create an environment of humidity, which we have to watch. You can I used too big of a container to start off, and then I had too much moisture in there, but I get faster germination using this chamber than I did with the heat mats, and I can control the temperature better. So, uh, the, for Shane, how you, uh, we're wondering how we transplant our onions. Um, the past couple of years, we've used a water wheel transplanter with a wheel, uh, double dibbler wheel that would poke two heel, two uh, two holes. Um, Glenn, you still there? I don't know if yep. you were. Yeah, okay. no, right, that's, that's how we use water wheel transplanter and to yep. transplant our onions out. Okay. The double dibbler wheel. Great. And then I, uh, it looks like Natasha's question's next, and that's probably something that you each have a, maybe a different uh, response for. So um, she asked, could you talk a little about light requirements for seed starting, and do different crops have different light requirements? Maybe Glenn, if I guess just to, to help out here, Glenn, do you mind starting to answer that? As far as with uh, light requirements, well, I guess we've just had them in our green greenhouse um, um, that way. So I, it's I guess whatever the, is how it is for the day. I guess I thought that was more of a with the, the germination that, chamber. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah, Susan, do you have a response for that? Yes, they, I mean, they, I use light. I don't know that they, how much light they really need in that germination chamber. As you can see, my light is on the bottom. So it's light in there, but not, 
you know, it's not real bright or anything. It's not like when you grow them under uh, grow lights or something. It seems to work. I, I can say that there's a question further down about um, how long they stay in the chamber. We use the light for, for heat as well as as the light source, but they we get them out of there really quickly. As soon as the seedlings have germinated, we move them out. They've got, you know, those first, um, not the true leaves, but the first leaves on, we move them into the other building and get them on heat mats, which we actually put them on sand, um, sand trays over the heat mats so that they don't get too hot. Um, I guess one one thing with light, uh, I it, when we first start up in the end of January, it it it's a noticeable difference once we get into February for for light for how fast our plants grow. Um, the the main reason we start so early is we've we've have a lot a bunch of our plants go uh, to central Iowa, or and then some that are in zone five A. Uh, out east. Uh, that's the only reason why we start that early. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't start uh, until Valentine's or until right now for starting plants. Question for you, Glenn. Are you using any other light source than the natural light coming through the tunnel? No, no. It, we haven't, uh, haven't been... Uh, the I, I we have, I don't see a need for that with a um, with what we're doing the I guess the biggest the having the heat on the tables has helped us out the most anyway for getting them to germ that way as far as for light and they're on a heat source when they're you have them um... yeah we've got uh, the the one greenhouse we have. Uh, half inch pecs that's spaced uh, I think two or three inches apart and then in this new greenhouse that we had gotten he had it, it was a used greenhouse he had it set up with a three quarter inch black water pipe and uh, so there's there's different ways you can move the um, heat for hot water under the tables that way um. There was a question here from Denise whether I cover the seeds in the germ chamber. I don't cover them. Let's see. I don't know if we if we put if I think there are technically I would say that there probably are different uh, light requirements for starting seeds, but I would say that in our system is a pretty, um, uh, I don't know, you might refer to it as a tough love system. They, they survive and they're really sturdy and we seldom have problems with them even though it's not the system that I would have thought we needed. Maybe I can put it that way. I, I think that when I've read the books about how you're supposed to start seeds, we're not really necessarily doing it that way, nor are we treating our seedlings according to the book, but they seem to do well in the system that we're using, and that's what matters to me. So I think it's about figuring out your own system and what works for you. Um, another question there. Uh, yeah, starting actually, Susan, just to, just to piggyback off that in case, uh, off Natasha's question about the, the different lighting requirements, um, I noticed you both have different uh, irrigation, you know, methods um, that Susan, you use a, you you hand, um, you know, spray everything, and Glenn has it on a timer. Do you do you um, do you do, do you um, see that there's a difference between varieties for the requirements for watering? Then it, it absolutely, falls. and that's that's part of the problem with an automatic watering system in our germination house is that we're we're moving seedlings trays around and we're moving them in and out so fast so that we can we have a situation where we might have a, a tray that's just starting um, 
close to a tray that's midway through its growth process, and it's just hard to come up with this watering system that would work for both of those trays. And part of it's because of the soil blocks. Soil blocks can dry out really quickly, and as the plants get larger in them, they need more water. And I've talked to a couple of people about automating the system and generally haven't been able to figure out how we could do that. Is that is that the question? Yeah. Am I answering what you were asking? Okay. Yeah, that's good. And Glenn, as far as you go, like when you have your um, greenhouse on an automatic water, is that when it's all onions, or do you uh, vary that according to what kind of plants you're starting in there? I for I vary it for what we have it for plant plants in there. Usually, I, most of the time, the zone is set for four or five minutes, and if if we didn't have the timer, uh, I, th I think our success rate for plants would be quite a bit, uh, wouldn't be very good for what. Okay, well, uh moving yeah Glenn was having trouble with his internet connection a little bit earlier it looks like he just got booted out so hopefully he can log back in and help answer some questions but um, Susan it might just be you for a minute here okay. so um, luckily that um, I, I think uh, okay so actually there was a question from Jake about um, starting pumpkin seeds in soil blocks Susan is that something that you start indoors with soil blocks or is that something you plant just outdoor direct seed we seldom grow pumpkins, but we do start summer squash in soil blocks. We do use the, I, I neglected to put that on my list uh, of things that we start in the larger blocks. So we use the 72s, 72 per tray, to start um, summer squash. And cucumbers, melons, any of the vining crops, you need to be extremely careful and watch their growth and get them out of there as quickly as you can because they will overgrow and tangle with one another, making it difficult to plant them and causing damage when you do plant them. Okay, and then um, Susan, also, do you know? Do you have any resources like for Angie's question about uh, the spreadsheet that you showed earlier on starting seeds about you know how many seeds per per uh, plug and what the timing and all of that? Uh, that's a tough one. I have been doing it for so long. I think I just created my own in the in the beginning. I just created my own system and experimented with things enough to um, figure out, you know, kind of where I needed to be in terms of the number of um, seedlings per block. We've done a lot of experimentation with that. Um, in terms of deciding how many trays we need, that sort of thing, we work backwards from what we want um, in our boxes. We start with our CSA boxes and decide what we want in the box, and then we work backwards from that. Uh, Nick I asked if we how we harden off our onions. Uh, I guess I. We had them on a wagon, a picture of all the plants on the wagon. That's We usually try to set them out there for a couple days uh, before we um, mail them out. Uh, for our onions that we mail out, we um, pull, pull them uh, out of the plug tray and take off the excess dirt. Um, and then we ship them... Um, by a postal USPS. Okay, and then there were two questions here about um, potential rodent control in your in your hoop houses and and with seeds and with seedlings. Do either of you have issues with that? Do you have any uh, advice for that? Um, we definitely have problems in the beginning with mice and 
I have uh, three cats <laughs> that hang out in the in the house with us, and in addition to that, we set traps and keep a close eye on that early. The first round is really when we have the most problem. And after that, we're moving in and out of the house so much in terms of people and pets. And I think that the mice find a better place to be. So I probably don't have any good uh, good tips other than a lot of activity and the cats. Uh, we've we've had our share of troubles with mice in the past too. Uh, traps, traps that we mainly use traps. Um, We've used uh, mothballs in a container to as a deterrent. Um, okay, great. Um, it looks like Chad has a question here about uh, what fertilizers either of you use on on the transplants. Uh, I don't with the with the C three. We typically don't need to use fertilizers on the transplants. Uh, we've used a product called Sumagrow, and we've also mixed in uh, some molasses for a little extra sugar to help the uh, get a stronger plants uh, so that they size up nicer before we ship them out. And we've also okay, used then, fish in the past too, I guess, for fertilizing. Okay. Um, Glenn, as far as the uh, the custom starts that you do for other growers, how do you uh, how do you price those? Uh, Nick asked if they're uh, by bench space per week or by variety. And I know you mostly do this for onions, but do you, could you explain that a little bit? The onions are our mainstay. Um, but the, as far as custom starts, it, there's a few variables in it. Uh, um, we've usually done by the, by the uh, flat price is what we've done. Um, and then that's been our starting point. And then it's a matter of if we're providing the seeds or if they are, or if uh, we, one person that we rent space to, they come in and plant them. And then we just we, uh, keep them watered and warm for them. So there's there's a few variables in it determining the price for what we do for that. Uh, our onion transplants for un orders under five thousand are uh, seven cents a plant, and orders over that amount are six cents. Uh, by the flat, we do seventeen dollars a flat. Great. Then there's looks like there's a question about any problems in. Uh, I guess maybe this is either the germination chamber or in your um, greenhouses with molds or insect control. Either of you have issues with those? Uh, I haven't had any trouble with mold. Um, I've maybe had um, trouble with fungus gnats, but that's because it was too wet, so we just cut back on our water a little bit and then it clears up and I guess my wife reminded me that we've had trouble with slugs already too before we have occasionally had trouble with mold and it's usually related to issues with air movement that we're not getting the building ventilated when we need to um, the, the circulating fans the four fans certainly help with that and as Glenn said water watering overwatering can be an issue for the the mold and probably the insects I guess we have had trouble with mold in our if we, when we've started uh, winter squash just from the canopy being too dense that it's not getting enough air through it. Um, that's the only thing we've really had any trouble with mold in. Okay, great. And um, Susan, looks like there's a question here from Nick about do you have any tips for moving 
the weight of the wood trays and blocks out to the field. I guess that would probably be, I think Nick was the one that asked earlier about why using wood trays as opposed to the plastic ones. I think that's what he's talking about. We um, we use wagons, but we also we use a we have a Kubota tractor that we had a custom. My nephew built a bucket for it that's designed to hold um, six trays, and so that's very helpful. It's a hydrostatic tractor that everybody loves to drive, and it works really well for moving trays out to the field as well as other many many other tasks, including harvesting. Yeah, it looks like um, the question about the spread seats then was uh, a lot of people chimed in here with some resources for those. Um, so that might catch us up here with the questions that have been in the chat box, and we still have a little more time if people have more questions for these folks. I didn't have a good picture of it, but one of the things that's really useful if we're seeing plants in the germ house that need to be moved out is to for for a wide variety of reasons. They're just they need we need to slow them down because we can't get them in the field quite yet, whatever it might be. We have a wagon that we a hay rack that we put hoops over and so we can throw a row cover over that, put the trays on the on the wagon, set it out under a big shade tree that we have, throw a row cover um, over that, a remay type row cover over that with and clip it on to the hoops and hold them out there for a longer period of time. And if we are having any kind of insect problems, it deals with we get rid of them that way. We've had aphids rarely, but it has happened. And we just simply move them out to that wagon. An old-timey covered wagon, then, in the field, huh? Right. That's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> well, Susan, looks like Jordan has a question for you about the slide that we're sitting on right here with the, uh, the Asian green mix. Um, have you tried to mix with with anything else? We have. We have a. Uh, a kale mix that we're working with right now that I kind of like. And that one actually comes packaged, uh, but it's not in a pellet. So it's a random kind of thing that we've used. Um, Johnny's, we've been hoping, talking with Randy at Johnny's Seeds to get him to pellet the Asian greens mix. And so he sent us a couple of samples of mixes that we tried. Um, so far, we haven't found anything actually that works as well as our Asian mix that we designed ourselves. And the question um, is a 72 too small? No, we used the 120 for the Asian greens mix, so I'm sure you could use a 72, which is which is actually, in our case, if, if I'm understanding this right, that would be a bigger block in our case. So see, seeing Kelly's question here reminded me that she actually asked this earlier. I'm sorry, Kelly, that we missed this. But So she's asking about, after germinating the seeds in the germ chamber, Susan, you move them out to the greenhouse, and do you put heat pads under them, or do you just let the heat, uh, the greenhouse, you know, warmth in there do the job? It depends on what the temperature is in the greenhouse. Sometimes at night I'll run the heat pads like I, I referred to. Um, we use trays, the regular plastic trays with sand in them, and then we set the little channel germ trays on top of that, and so that sand seems to um, keep the seedlings from getting too hot. It's really hard to keep them watered sufficiently if they get too warm. So um, we do provide them with some heat if we need to. And I'll turn the mats on at night. And occasionally I will throw, I have that little, that area, it's about a, let's see, 
four by eight area that's set up with hoops so that I can throw a plastic or a row cover over the top of it to hold some of the heat in at night. So it's really a combination of both. We don't we don't heat the tunnel for that purpose, but we do use the heat mats when we need to. Ah, and then Glenn, uh, if you don't mind chiming in, Glenn, I know you you talked about the coin book corn boiler that you use for the radiant heat setup that you've got. Could you explain that real basically? It's a water system. Uh, yeah. Let's see. The, so they heat, we heat the water up. Uh, it comes into the greenhouse and then we just we circulate it uh, with the uh, we actually have two in this greenhouse we have two zones. Uh, and then we have it, the pumps are on a uh, thermostat so that it we don't, uh, it doesn't get too warm on the benches. I think we usually have it set at 70. And then our ambient temperature, we set that at 60. Usually, most of the time, when with we've found with the with our heat on the benches, that most of the time the stuff will be germinated in four or five days. Right, and and just looking at the uh, tubing that you've got here, Glenn, do you ever? I mean, do, does it germinate real evenly? Even though you know there are gaps in between well, those, do you ever rotate your trays? Uh, or I, I touched on that a little bit in our before this is actually there should be one in between each of these uh, this I, this is a decent spacing here we've we learned the hard way on it I um, you, you want them closer together so that it's more even Great, thank you. Um, well, we still got a little more time left. If folks still there uh, have questions to type in the chat box, go ahead. We've got about ten more minutes if if we need it. Um, otherwise, it looks like Carl's got something here. Could do either of you have quality control practices for plants leaving the greenhouse? I assume this would be more important for Glenn, who's you know selling plants wholesale rather than Susan, who's planting them you know just outside the the greenhouse. Well, for or we try to, we only send out the best of the plants. We usually plant 20% more than what we need so that we have a better selection of plants. Uh, for if, if some don't, for some reason something doesn't germ or uh, that way, then we have, we still have enough of the plants that are good. Great. Susan, do you have anything to, to add about that? On quality control? If, yeah, yeah, like yeah, Glenn if, said he plants 20% more. Do you do anything like that? Usually, usually if there's an issue with germination or something along those lines or I see something that doesn't look healthy, I simply get it out of there before we just take and we have an area that we dump them into and... Um, it's sort of, we, we end up using that area outside for another purpose, but but the seedlings, we just get them out of the greenhouse so that they don't cause any problems with the surrounding plants or whatever might, might be the problem with them. It's a waste of space largely also if we, got, if we had poor germination on one of our trays. I'd, I'm going to go back to that 72 now that I understand what the question was. Thank you, Laura, three, for explaining the question. Um, the 72 for, for doing an Asian, the plastic tray 72 for doing an Asian mix might be on the small side, but I think the, the issue would be to move them out to the field or the green, to the high tunnel, wherever you're planting them, at a smaller stage. 
and it could work fine. I would experiment with it. Uh, the spring, uh, Jake had a question about their micro sprinklers. Uh, we've gotten them from Nolts Midwest Produce Supply of, in Colwell. Uh, they're, uh, I'm trying to think of what brand they are. We've gotten our, our valves, uh, timer, and our the drops and the uh, sprinklers from there. Um, let me see if I can find my phone. I can put contact uh, info for Nolts. That's where we've gotten a lot of our greenhouse supplies for as far as irrigation and um, and uh, heating and cooling. And we've our on the our four foot benches we've got um, green. I think it was a green and yellow. I think it was green nozzle on the yellow spreader. And then we have have them spaced. Uh, three feet apart, uh, and then we, on the wider bench we have uh, uh, they're a little. I see they're seven feet apart, and then we, it's a nine foot wide bench. So it looks like uh, Helen has a question here then too, um, saying that she has had luck germinating pepper seeds and then putting them, once the ones have started, into a starting soil. And and I, I that might be something that folks do on a kind of a smaller scale. Susan or Glenn, have you ever had any experience with starting seeds like that initially and then putting them into a starting soil? Well, I'm not sure how she's germinating them. I mean, we germinate ours in in the, we call, I don't know what they're properly called, but I call it a channel tray. So we're germinating a lot of seeds in a tiny bit of soil, and then we do transplant them from that tray into the soil blocks. So it sounds like it's the same principle. And we don't do Susan. that. Go ahead. No, that's what I was going to ask, is if, if she says, she mentioned she does something like that for peppers, do you do that for peppers or anything else? We only do that for peppers, eggplants, and tomatoes, and all of our other seeds we plant directly into the soil block, and our goal is 100% germination, and we do pretty well with most seedlings. I would say that that's also a factor in our quality control is that if I have a variety that doesn't work well in my system, I try it twice probably and then I don't use it again. And it might be that they're a little bit finicky and our system doesn't really work with um, seed, seeds that are difficult to germinate or especially some certain varieties we've had problems with. Oh, she's starting them on a damp paper towel. No, I do not do that. Yeah, it sounds like a similar system to those uh, little trays that you use. Um, and then as far as dealing with plastic trays, I know obviously, uh, Susan, you do a lot of the soil blocking, but um, you do use plastic trays for those smaller ones. And any thoughts about um, the longevity of those plastic trays for either of you and, um, you know, waste other waste plastics well our flats we try to we try to use them as long as we can we I think we've we're on some of them were on our third or fourth year for their um, but they, they do eventually wear out um, as far as dealing with the waste I, I haven't come up with a good solution for that other than reusing them as long as we can before they um, wear our junk. We have the same experience as Glenn. The, the limited number of trays that we use, we try to um, 
handle them carefully and keep them as long as we can. And as far as dealing with waste plastics, they're off and on. There's been a recycling opportunity in Cedar Rapids, but right now there isn't one. In response to Helen's question, I've never used rock wool or a clone bucket for starting seeds. Yeah, I got to be honest, I'm not quite sure what that means uh, from Helen, rock wool and clone bucket. Um, we are, so Angie looks like she's got another question in here, and then maybe this is it, unless somebody gets their question in right away. So we're about out of time here. But Angie says, um, starting seeds in a hoop house versus a greenhouse. Would you recommend covering the trays with row cover, or do you think it would be okay without covering? Um, I don't know that. I mean, basically, my germination house is a hoop house. And I have, in the past, used a much larger uh, hoop house to start seedlings. And with the, I qualify this, because we're using soil blocks, I have not felt that we needed to cover the trays with the row cover. Um, it's, it's been fine without it. Ah, it's not a double insulated um, greenhouse, a high tunnel. Yeah, that might be a little bit different. I think that if it's, pretty cool. You might need to um, use a row cover. Um, we yeah, also... I, I would recommend a row, row cover uh, and pro depending on what point of the year, uh, definitely germination chamber before going out, out to the tunnel. Yeah, I agree. I think the germination chamber and then to the hoop house would would probably work. And one of the things we did, depending upon the size of your hoop house, we hung a plastic curtain up and sort of to, to set off a small area. And then we did run some propane heat in there on occasion to warm it up a bit if we needed to for, <clears throat> for um, warm weather crops. Great. It looks like some folks here are providing some information about that rock wool and clone bucket, too. So maybe we oh, good. look into that. looks cool. Okay, well, I think this is a good time to wrap it up. Um, really great uh, questions from all the attendees tonight. Thanks for everybody for being so active in there and asking some great questions. And a huge thanks to both Glenn and Susan for uh, pr preparing these presentations and uh, and handling all these questions and taking the time to share their knowledge with us tonight. Um, like I said, we have another great farm in our next week. Next week is um, uh, cooler construction, walk-in cooler construction, so uh, check that out. Um, thanks for tuning in. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.